All right, just got the thumbs up from Joel in the crow's nest up there. It looks like we are live on the Facebook, and we're live here in person. At least I think all of y'all are live. Are you live this morning? Fantastic. That's wonderful. Stand up with me. We're going to start off uh, this Sunday with the song we ended last Sunday with. If you'll recall, last Sunday uh, we heard uh, a reminder of, of Angela's testimony uh, as she celebrated the anniversary, and we sang at the end about the great things that God has done, the great things He is doing, and the great things we know He's going to continue to do. So you can't sing this one sitting down, faux show. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Well, good morning, everybody. We are glad you're here at Hunter Hills. Today is a great day. It's always a good day when we can be together with our family. And it's been a great morning already. Uh, for those of us who were in class this morning, we got to hear from uh, Amanda Box, who we got to hear from all weekend, uh, yesterday all day in a conflict resolution uh, seminar. And I'm going to tell you what a great day it was. We, we learned a lot. And we learned a lot in class today. And this is Amanda right back here sitting next to Jordan. Amanda, right, right. we are glad that she's here. Her family is actually moving this weekend to College Station, Texas. So she decided to come here instead and um, to get away from a moving truck and let her husband take care of it. So we are doubly thankful that she was willing to spend time with us. And we appreciate it 
so, so very much. Um, I did learn, this is a new thing that I learned today, your official title in your business, you are the unleasher of awesomeness. Is that right? If I could pick a title, would that not be a great title to be the unleasher of awesomeness? But that is a great thing. So thank you uh, for being here. We're excited to be here. Stephen's preaching today. We're excited about that. And I, I do want to acknowledge one thing. Um, Bill Smith is having a birthday today, um, and I'm not going to tell you how old he is because that just wouldn't be appropriate, um, but I'm 60 and he's 20 years older than me, so I'll just let you get, do the math and figure that out, but happy birthday to Bill, and we uh, just what a blessing it is that God is blessing him, and we pray continued blessings on that. I see Bob sitting right here uh, with his cane. That is not a weapon. That is a cane to help him walk. Um, we want to be like Lois and have a cane, that's right. So we'll get you a chair with handles on it so you'll have be a way to get up and down. But it's just so good to see everybody uh, here uh, today. I do want to do one thing today before we continue in our worship. You know, this is a big week um, for our kids, for our children. School starts this week, and I know they are so excited about that. I know a lot of schools start on Thursday of this week. So we want to do this this morning. So... For our young people, if you are starting kindergarten, this is your first year to go to school, stand up. Anybody going, is anybody going to kindergarten? Nobody's going to kindergarten? All right, so first grade to sixth grade, stand up. First grade to sixth grade. I know you're in here, so stand up. Let's go. First grade to sixth grade, good. Junior high and high school, you guys stand up, nope, stay back up, stay back, other guys stay up. Back rows, junior high and high school, stand up. 4K. We do have 4K, excuse me. If you are a 4K person, you may have to stand in the chair, but if you're a 4K person, stay, stay up. Everybody stay up. Don't sit back down. If you're a teacher, if you're a teacher, stand up. Just look around this room. It's a big week for some people. Uh, this week. So we want to just, before we go any further, let's just take a moment and pray uh, for these guys, and then we'll continue in our worship. Let's all pray together. Father, thank you for the ways you bless the Hunter Hills Church, and one of the ways you've blessed us is through the heritage of children. And Father, we thank you for that. And as we look around this room and we saw, see all of these uh, young people on their feet, uh, we just lift them up to you as they begin uh, a new school year. Last year was tough. And so, Lord, this year we just pray a blessing on them. Pray that it'll be a great year. And that they'll be able to enjoy it. That um, things will just return to, to somewhat normal. Whatever that is or whatever that looks like. And, Father, for these teachers who work so hard and give so much, we thank you. And, Lord, I pray a blessing on them. Give them energy when they need it. Give them the words that they need. Uh, give them the courage to do the things that they need to do. And, Father, thank you for the ways that they bless our children. And, Lord, today, again, we just say thank you for being God. Thank you for being the one that we have gathered here to celebrate and to worship. And, as always, thank you for Jesus who gave himself for us. And it's through him that we pray. Amen. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Watch the waters part before us now. Watch the waters part before us now. Come and see what he has done for us. Tell the world of his great love. Our God is a God who saves. Let go. 
enemies will run for sure. The church will stand, she will endure. The church will stand, she will endure. He holds the keys of life, our Lord. Death has no sting, no final word. This is the day, this is the day. 
This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, I will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Amen. Have a seat. Good morning. All right. So uh, I'm, I was told that I'm supposed to keep this short because this is not the sermon. Although I do imagine that when this table was instituted by Jesus, that one of the things he imagined and one of the things that they probably practiced was sitting around that table and enjoying a meal together. And at some point, somebody, a man, one of the men, one of the women, who knows, would have spoken up and said something that triggered a conversation that may have led to teaching and preaching and uh, back and forth about how to live and how to be Christian and how, what it means to be a follower of God. So I am going to take a minute, but not very many minutes. So today our, our spiritual discipline is service. And I don't know, many of you um, may think just like me, when you think of service, I immediately think of military service. That's one of the things we always talk about in this country, especially, is military service. We're thankful for those who serve our country. But as I've been on a spiritual journey, my thoughts on military service have, have changed. And those thoughts on military service kind of lead me to the thought of war. And then the thought of war leads me to, well, War is all about perspective, if you think about it. War is all about perspective. When you have a war, you have two sides that are fighting each other. Maybe more than two sides could be fighting each other. Who decides which side is right? Who decides which side is just? How, how do the mothers of the soldiers decide which side is just? I bet they would probably land on the side that their own sons are on right? What do you think they pray for when their sons and daughters are going out on the battlefield? If you were a German mother during World War II, what do you think you'd be praying for? So how does God decide which side is just? To me, I think God just sees his children fighting each other. Same way I see my children fighting each other, throwing things at each other in the pool, dunking each other underwater, whatever they feel like doing that day. And so I start to think about the perspective of Jesus and the perspective that God has. And I think the whole point of our Christian journey is to gain the same perspective that God has. You know, before Jesus, there were glimpses of God. But if you read John, John chapter 1... John chapter 1, verse 14 says, The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. So one of the things that's also changed is my perspective on what the Word of God is. And I'm thinking about in Roman times where the Word was usually the right-hand man of the Caesar or whoever was in charge, and they were the ones that would carry out the will of the one in charge. So if you think about the language that would have been used at the time, they would have understood the Word. Jesus is the Word of God. He's the one that's going to carry out the mission that God intends and wants and desires for all of us. And so there's a, there's a lot of different things that Jesus says and actually, I mean, contradicts a lot of the things that are said in the Old Testament. Now, I have a whole list of them, but I'm only going to read one. Uh, sorry. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, it says, If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands, I give you today the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord our God. Then he goes on in verse 12. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season 
and to bless all the works of your hand. Essentially what the writer of Deuteronomy is saying here is you do what God says, you follow God's commands, you're a righteous person, God's going to bless you. And then he goes on to list a whole bunch of things that God's going to bless you with. But then fast forward to Matthew, Jesus, the Word, actually God in the flesh, and Jesus says, But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his Son rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and the unjust. So, you know, as I was thinking about this, thinking about the Olympics and everything going on, The Olympics is the world coming together to compete. And really the only major division that happens at the Olympics is when they get on the podium at the end, and if you won gold, your country's national anthem gets played. But that's really the only major division that happens. It's all people competing together, and you see, I love after the swimming events and the running events, you see all the people coming together and hugging on each other, and man, that's what the kingdom of God looks like to me. And so as I sit and think about what the table means, the table to me is God's answer of how do we handle our enemies? What do we do with our enemies? Because it's not just us that's welcome at the table. It's not just the people who've declared that they belong to God and want to follow God. It's every human being on the planet. They're all welcome at the table. And to me, that's what this represents This represents a time for us to change our perspective on what it means to be human, on what it means to be a child of God, and who is included in that. So let's pray. Dear God, we come before your throne this morning, and we thank you so much for the love that you have for us, for the perspective that you provide us through your son, Jesus. God, I pray that we'll open our hearts and our minds and we'll listen to the words of Jesus and truly take them to heart that we'll truly strive to live just like he did and to answer evil with good and answer evil with love. God, I thank you for this table and what it represents, and I thank you that we can all gather around it and, and celebrate your Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming. Chases me down, finds still I'm found, leaves the ninety-nine. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. When I was your foe, so, so good to me. When I felt no worth, you paid it all for me. You have been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. Oh, Chases me down, fights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it, still you give yourself away. coming after me there's no wall you won't kick down 
Lying won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lying won't tear down, coming after me. And so, God, today, we come uh, before your throne. We come with confidence, God, but not because of anything we've done. Uh, we come boldly, God, because you told us to. Uh, we come boldly and with confidence to give you thanks because we know that the grace that we've received uh, through our Savior Jesus, the one whom you sent, who was your word, who was your example of humanity to us, came, he lived, he died, uh, he served while he was here, and now we get to live into that glorious example uh, of service to others and love for you. And so, God, we just give you thanks today, and we say amen. All right, we're going to go ahead and dismiss our little ones. That would be our kids ages three to kindergarten. Uh, Miss Jordan is back there in the back. She's waiting for you, so head towards her and go enjoy a time of special worship. Good morning, everybody. Apparently, I've garnered a reputation, and sometimes when you have a reputation, it doesn't matter what you do, it always sticks. This morning, it was announced that I am preaching. Here I am in the flesh. And immediately after that, I got three texts from three of my loving teens in the youth group <laughs> that went by. Well, what they said was, I got one, don't cry. I got one, are you going to cry? And one that said, it's okay, Stephen, you don't have to cry. You'll do great. I would say that parents, you need to take your phones away from your children immediately, especially when they're in worship, but I also had a teen mom ask me if I was going to cry this morning. <laughs> so I can tell you, though, very confidently this morning that it is definitely a possibility that I will cry. And when that happens, I will be awkward, and I apologize in advance. But thank you for the loving, kind support that my teens have given me. I love you. This morning, as Thomas mentioned, our spiritual discipline uh, is service. Uh, it seems a little bit different because when we think about spiritual disciplines, a lot of times I think about um, practices that God gives us that we kind of do by ourselves, right? We do um, it in our own room, by ourselves. It's just us and God alone. That's what we normally think of. But this morning, we're talking about service, and how it's a practice that draws us closer to God. Because that's really what spiritual disciplines are. They simply are practices that God gives us in order to help us draw closer to Him. This morning, we're going to talk about exactly how service does that. We're going to be in Mark chapter 10. So if you have your Bibles, if you have your phones, if you want to go ahead and flip over to Mark chapter 10, that's where we'll be. Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 42. And calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not so among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever wishes to be first among you shall be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. This is one of those passages that is almost a staple passage for Christians as it talks about service. 
and how what it means to be a person in the kingdom of God and what it means to be great in the kingdom of God. I didn't really read the introduction uh, to this, but the story and the background behind Jesus' words here is that there was an argument among the disciples because Jesus is walking along with his disciples and then a helicopter mother flies in. James and John's mom think that James and John are the best. Like all good mothers, they think that their children are the best. This morning, I had my grandma visiting me. We call her BB. BB has eight grandchildren, and it just so happens. I guess it was luck of the draw. I don't know what it was, but she has the eight most beautiful and talented people that have ever existed in the history of the universe. And I'm one of them. So y'all are lucky to see me this morning. Everybody who's ever met me is the luckiest person ever, according to Bibi. And James and John, they just think that their mom thinks that James and John are just the best, right? And so she comes in and she asks Jesus, Jesus, can James and John sit at your left and right hand when your kingdom comes? This kind of makes the other disciples mad. Because they want to be at the left and right hand of Jesus, right? When Jesus' kingdom comes, they want to be in the position of authority. Because it's kind of nice when you're in authority. You get to tell people what to do. You get to give them orders and they can serve you. And Jesus says, you guys kind of have it backwards. You guys are kind of acting like the Gentile rulers. No offense, Gentiles. But sometimes when your leaders are in authority, they use it to press down and crush other people. But not so with you guys. Not so with the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, the people who are the greatest are not the ones who are being served. The greatest in the kingdom of God take the lowest position. They take the position of a slave. So we're going to talk about service, how it's a practice that draws us closer to God. First of all, it's a practice because service is something that we need to exercise. It's not always very natural for us. It doesn't come very naturally. Sometimes we're a lot like the disciples here. Now, maybe our aspirations aren't as high as the disciples. Most of us probably don't expect to be sitting at the right hand of Jesus in his kingdom. We'll leave that to the great saints. Maybe it's Peter, maybe it's or James. Maybe they did make it in. But for us, our aspirations aren't that high. But we may like to be served. We may like to be in positions where people see us and people honor us. Maybe in our places of work, maybe as a parent, maybe in school, we like for people to recognize that we're the best at what we do. And maybe a lot of times our natural inclination is for people to serve us. When I think about my family members, when I think about my coworkers, Sometimes what's on our minds more often is, are they serving me enough? Sometimes when we go to church, our main idea of church and what we, mo- what we want most out of church is whether church fills me. That's our first priority sometimes. Is church filling me? Am I hearing the right songs at church? Was the sermon good enough for me at church? That's sometimes our natural inclination. And so we need to practice service in order to get better. It's a practice to learn to be like Jesus, to learn to think about others more than we think about ourselves. And sometimes we need the practice because even when we try to serve, sometimes we're just not that great of it. I fall short of actually good service all the time. Because sometimes we serve, and we serve just because it benefits us. Maybe we just feel like If I serve, that means I'm a good person, or I'm going to serve because I know I need to. I'm a youth minister, and part of my job is to create events for these teens to do. And sometimes it's just easy to say, man, we need a service project. Why? Not because there's people who need our service, but it's easy to make a service project just because that's what all youth groups do. All churches do that. All churches do service. And so we just do service just for service sake, or we do it even for our own benefit. And so sometimes even when we do service, we don't necessarily do it right. Another thing we do is we like to pick and choose what kind of service that we do. Last week, uh, I had the opportunity to go with some of our teens uh, to Colorado. We went and served with an organization called Dry Bones. And what Dry Bones does is they make friends with and they help homeless young people. Generally, it's from the ages of 18 to 30. And so we got the opportunity to go to Dry Bones to work with some of those homeless people. And we learned a lot about the homeless situation in Denver. And one thing that they helped us realize and at least remind ourselves is that when you have a lot of wealth, 
you get to make a lot of choices. This morning, when you guys woke up, you probably had a closet full of clothes and you got to pick out which outfit you wanted to wear. Right now, you may be thinking about where you're going to go to lunch after this. There's so many restaurants close by you could go to, or if you're going to go home, you probably have enough stuff in your pantry to make all different kinds of meals. And so when you have wealth, when you have resources, you have a lot of choices. If you're also in the position to serve other people, unfortunately, you can also make choices about when and where and how you're going to serve. Sometimes we make the mistake of only serving where it's comfortable, only serving where it's easy, only going to the nice neighborhoods to serve where we know it's not dangerous. We don't want to take our kids to the dangerous neighborhoods. Only serving maybe where it's clean. Only serving when it's only going to last a few hours. If it's a whole day, that's a little crazy. And so we feel good because we've done and done some service, but by the time we've picked where we're going to go, how long we're going to do it, if it's in the right place, we have found a service opportunity that perfectly fits our preferences. Isn't that beautiful? And so sometimes that's the way we are. And it's just painful to think about that even when we try to serve, sometimes about myself, ourselves. Unfortunately, I do that, that all the time. And so service is a practice that we need to get better at. Because obviously, this picture of service that I've painted isn't a very Christ-like one. It's not the best one. Instead, Christ gives us a picture of service that is totally other-centered, that is willing to go anywhere and serve anybody for the sake of them. True service is about letting go of what I want and what I need, and true service is about going where other people need me, and it's for their sake. And so truly, service is a practice that we need to continually work on because it's so easy to point the direction and the focus back at me. And so service is a practice that we need to grow in. So let's ask the question, how does service draw us closer to God, right? Because that's what spiritual practices that draw us closer to God. So how does service do that? We're going to look at it in a couple of different ways. We're going to look at how it does it for the body of Christ as a whole, and how it does that for me individually. So first of all, in the body of Christ, when we use our gifts and abilities that God has given us to serve each other, we help other people use their gifts and abilities to serve one another. And over time, what we become is a fully functioning body of Christ. In Corinthians, Paul gives us a pretty detailed picture of this body of Christ. He talks about how some people are hands. Some people are feet, some people are eyes, others are mouths. And when one part of the body hurts, the rest of the body joins with it and mourns. When one of the body rejoices, though, everybody comes and rejoices with them. And so when we use our gifts for each other, whether we're a mouth, whether we're a hand, whether we're a foot, whatever part we play in the body of Christ, when we use it to serve each other, and when we encourage each other to use each of our gifts, then we become a fully functioning body of Christ that glorifies God. We become a church that has eyes to see where people have needs. We have a mouth that's ready to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. We have feet that are ready to go and hands that are real, willing to go and serve where service is needed in our communities and even inside of our own building and inside of our own churches. And so the more we serve, the more we serve each other as brothers and sisters of Christ, we have that fully functioning body that is living out the ideal community of Christ that God always intended for his people. And so when we do that, we become a temple of the living God, a temple that shows people who God is, and hopefully when they interact with us as a fully functioning body of God, it becomes a tangible living experience of God with us because we are his temple. And so we draw nearer to God as a church as we become who we're supposed to be when we use our gifts and our abilities to serve each other. There's another way that I think service at least helps us individually. I mentioned that we went to Colorado last week, and we spent the first half of the week in the wilderness, in the woods of the Rocky Mountains. And while we were there, we did some different meditative practices. We did some spiritual formation. 
And so one thing our guide led us to do is we just went out into a spot in the woods and we stood there and he said, imagine this little square foot right in front of you. And all I want you to do is look at it, right? So we just look, reflect on this spot, notice all of the different things that are there. Then the next thing he asked us to do was to get on our knees or crouch down, get a little bit closer to the ground and start noticing more. Keep on reflecting, do the exact same thing. And then he had us lay fully down on the ground with our face two inches above the ground. And he said, do the same thing, just reflect on your little spot. And then after that, we came together, we talked as a group, reflected on what we had just done. And he said, what was it like as you got closer and closer to the ground? A couple of things that we noticed is that you saw more detail. You noticed more stuff. You saw more beauty. Maybe you saw some of the little insects that you didn't see before. The second thing when you got closer, when you got closer to the ground was it felt more like your space. You had more identity with it. Imagine that you just spent all that time with that one space right there and somebody just comes and stomps on that ground right in front of you. At that moment, we would have been crushed. We didn't care about that spot 20 seconds ago, but now that was our, our spot. I think service does for us what that little practice did for us as well. From a distance, we can label people. From a distance, we can label people. We can judge people and we can assess people, whether they're safe enough, whether they're good enough, whether they're worthy enough. As you get closer, though, teen, stop smiling. As you get closer you can start to see more of the beauty. As you get closer to a person, as you get to know them more, maybe as you go to those neighborhoods that you initially thought were dangerous, maybe you'll meet a single mother who cares for her children. I apologize again. So, you meet people, and as you get closer to them, you see more of the beauty. You see why God cares so much about them why God loves them. You see what God does for us in his compassion and his grace. And so you grow more and you have more love like God has. This also happens to Christ in John chapter 4 where he meets the woman at the well. Jesus goes and talks with this woman. The disciples come up and they stumble upon Jesus talking to the Samaritan woman and they are in shock. The disciples are standing at a distance from that woman They could assess this woman. She was a Samaritan. She probably wasn't somebody you wanted to talk to. She probably didn't really like God all that much. If they had heard that she had been married to five people and was living with a man that she wasn't married to, imagine what the disciples would have thought. Imagine what some of us would have thought. From a distance, it would have been easy for them to just keep that woman at arm's length and not serve her. But Jesus is totally different. He encounters the woman. He loves the woman. He sees the beauty of the woman as a creation of God and as what she is. When we're willing to serve anybody, anywhere, and if we're willing to give ourselves the chance to just get close to those people that we may have judged earlier, then we'll see that beauty in them. We'll see that they too are the creation of God just as worthy and valuable of love and service as we are. Service gives us that opportunity to know God more, to know his love, his compassion, and his grace more. We see more of what God does for us, and that's even big acts of service or that small acts of service. Maybe some of you, you have to serve your spouse or your kids even when you don't want to, even when they've been acting up, even when they haven't been nice and they haven't been serving you, you still give grace and compassion to them. You still serve them. And in that, you know God more because you know that God has been patient with you. He served you. He's loved you. He's died for you, even when you didn't deserve it. God found us in a place where maybe we didn't look too worthy, but God came in. He had that compassion, love, and grace. And so 
Service draws us closer to the heart of God because those in need, those who need to be taken care of are at the very heart of God. We know God more simply when we serve. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this morning and thank you for the opportunity to come here and gather as encourage each other and to love one another. God, I thank you for this church, Hunter, and the many people of it, in it who do use their gifts to serve and honor you, seek out those who are in need, who do the simple things like love their spouse, love their children, their friends, and other parts of their family so well. God, I pray that you continue to guide us in the spiritual discipline of service. Teach us to practice it each and every single day with each person that's right in front of us. Teach us to live the way of the life of Jesus. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Like Jerusalem, Lord, you have wept over me. In my moments of weakness and loss, I had nothing to give. So you offered your grace and your love and your son and a cross. I am loved by you. I am loved by you. Though I stumble and fall, in spite of it all, I am loved. I am loved by you. And what I could not bear, you took as your own all the slander that should have been mine. And by taking my place, my redemption is sealed by your will, by your hand, by design. I am loved by you. I am by you. Though I stumble and fall, in spite of all I am loved, I am loved by you. And no power I know that's on. Um, got the whole crew here. A um, little bit to talk about today. Um, Carl is away. He had some uh, important things going on at the prison, or he would be with us today as well. And um, we have a minister search update for you guys, and we just thought it was important enough to all get up here together and, uh, and do it with you. Um, my part is to just give a little background on, on what we've been doing. I know some of you have probably thought, are those guys doing anything at all? Are we ever, we ever going to get a new preacher at this joint? And, um, it's, uh, you know, we, we've, we've all together as a church and just as a people been through a, a, a bit of a strange time where I, I counted it up. We're, 
a year and a half into COVIDness. Um, and if you think back, it's, it really is weird to think back, you know, a year and a half ago, we weren't even meeting. Um, and that, in conjunction with Ryan's departure, um, really had the elders talking about what is church and what are we going to do next and what does the Lord uh, have in mind for Hunter Hills. And so we've been having that conversation and uh, praying a lot about it. And um, we, uh, we talked to you guys. We went to, went to some Sunday school classes and had some individual conversations about uh, what your hopes and about the future were. We talked to several men, preachers, um, and, you know, that we networked and some that we were interested in, some that were interested in us. And um, that uh, most of them, that led to nowhere. But uh, I do, I'm, I'm real reticent to say um, the Lord led us to do this thing. It sounds pious, but I, we believe that. We, we've been asking for it. I know y'all been asking for it. And um, I don't know exactly how all that works, but I think, I think that's where we're headed. So go back in your mind two years ago when you were in casual conversation with someone about their family, what's going on with their family, and you said, how are you guys doing? So often they would say, we're so busy, right? Do you remember that? Do you remember how busy we were? Well, if there was a silver lining that came from the pandemic, is that during the pandemic, you didn't say you were so busy, did you? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about how the pandemic erased much of the busyness from our life? And so now as our families are trying to get back engaged again in a post-COVID culture, I think many of our families are really trying to be wise and make decisions for our families about we want to be involved with things that aren't just busyness. We want to be involved in things that are truly meaningful. And so as we as shepherds were talking about that, of what does church look like in a post-COVID culture, how can we, as we are encouraging you and equipping you and engaging you, how can we make that meaningful? And there was a message there that the Spirit was trying to give us, but we just didn't have the words for it. And so as we were meeting one day with the guy we're about to introduce you to, he articulated this so well. And we just felt like the, the, the passion that he has for this was so in line with, with what we were thinking. And his passion from this comes from years of corporate experience and working with people, with years of being a shepherd at the church he's at now. So he gets this, he understands it, and he articulated it so well. So these words that you're seeing actually came from him, and I love the way he worded it, that, that, that church before the pandemic was just a gathering. We just got together. But now what we want to create as church after the pandemic is, is connecting. Sure, these are just semantics, just differences in words, but can you feel that difference? It's not just getting in a room with a bunch of people. It's connecting with the people in that room. That brings value. That's something you want for your family. He talked about casual versus intentional. And I'm not talking about the way we dress. We're not going to implement a non-casual dress code here. I'm talking about our attitude about when we're coming to church. Are we just casual and flipping about it and we're going to go up there to that church building and see what happens? That's casual. But intentional is when you're thinking about how can God use me? How can I bless other people? Is there someone I need to have a conversation with and encourage them? Is there someone maybe I need to, Amanda, confront in a loving way? Way. Is there something that, that we with good intentions can do? The difference between teaching and equipping. Not just giving people information, but of communicating how that information can equip people to be meaningful in the lives of others. And then finally, attendance versus engagement. There's more to church than just being here. It's being engaged. It's, it's being a part of a family and all that comes with that. And we hope that, like yesterday, the event, the information that Amanda brought to us, that was meaningful, right? That brings value. That's going to help shape our lives. And that's what we as a group of shepherds are committed 
to leading a church that, that provides that, those meaningful engagement opportunities. And we're so glad that the guy we're about to introduce you to, these were his words. He shares this passion. Okay, so when you look at those places that we want to go, and we believe that in Scripture it uh, has a vision for us as, uh, as, as the church to go, how do we get there? And how, how can we find someone who is gifted in, in leading us that way? And so, um, we asked the question, you know, what exactly are we looking for? Are we looking for just somebody that can get up and, and preach to us? Or are we looking for somebody that can, can encourage, equip, and engage us in this? And so, um, we looked for somebody that uh, had been down this road before, somebody that had some experience I'm going to a place where I, I really hadn't been uh, before. You know, a guide would be nice. And so um, that's what we were, were actually looking for. Um, also, uh, one of the things that, uh, about our church, if you've been here long enough, you, you realize we're doing an awful lot of these things already, and yet we're, we're not very, uh, I would say, organized, or we're not like an army moving together. And... Uh, and so someone who can, can help us, us with this is what we're looking for, which is what many of us, the shepherds, basically have been doing since we didn't have a, a lead minister. Or um, We've been spending a lot of our time in thinking about organizing, setting uh, time frames, and what are we going to do here, and what are we going to do there, and that type of thing. Uh, and, and we need somebody to help us with that so we can actually do what shepherds do, and that is be with the people. And uh, I'll offer this pastoring uh, component uh, that we hadn't had or that we haven't actually engaged as, as well as we could. And so we want to move into that. Uh, we bring somebody in as, as this person of interest. They're not going to know our congregation like 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 we know. They're not going to know you like we know you. And so as we're looking around for gifted people to do their giftedness in service, as Stephen talked about, um, they're not going to know you like we do. And so we want to become even better um, pastors uh, and um, allow this person to do what they're gifted at. And so um, that's part of our thinking as we go forward. So uh, with that, who is it? That's probably the big question in it. Who is it? Um, it's really interesting when, when um, Ryan left, the first name that came to my mind was Rusty Adair. And it's so interesting to me how God took us on this path of all of the things that you've heard so far to get us to this point, to where today we get to, to share with you that Rusty Adair is going to come and join us here at Hunter Hills as part of our church staff. So let me tell you a couple of things, you, remind you of a couple of things you probably already know about Rusty. One is he is really, really gifted as a speaker and as a communicator. I can't tell you how many times after he preached uh, during the times when we didn't have a preacher, I would get asked, so when are we going to hire that guy? Um, he is really, really good. So you know that he is a talented, talented communicator. The second thing is, is that he is one of us. He's a Prattville guy. He grew up here. He lived here. Many of us went to church with him and have known him for years. We've seen his family grow. We've seen him grow. We've been a part. We've got to minister with him. We got to serve with him in so many different ways. So he is one of us. And then probably his claim to fame is that he's Cody's daddy um, um, and Bree's father-in-law. Um, and that's a blessing too, I know, uh, for their, their family. But some th things maybe you don't know about Rusty. One is his uh, current job with International Papers. He's the Director of Human Resources and North American Recruiting uh, coordinator. He is a people person. He engages with people daily on multiple levels in multiple ways. 
He is a person who engages with people on a regular basis. He is currently an elder at the White Station Church in Memphis. He is um, one who has been a spiritual mentor to so many other people, to so many people. And that's an exciting thing about Rusty. He has so much experience in leadership, mentoring, developing ministries, member engagement, and discipleship. That's a lot of stuff, but let me boil it down to one sentence. Rusty has a passion for encouraging, equipping, and then engaging disciples of Jesus. He is a sold-out disciple of Jesus, and he wants every one of us to be the same way. He wants us to be sold out wholeheartedly, all in, bought in, disciples of Jesus Christ. And I cannot wait for us to get started. All right. Let's talk about some logistics. So, Dennis, give me the next one. So, Rusty's not coming here to, to have the title of lead preacher or lead minister it's going to look a little bit different, and we are extremely excited about this difference and want to make a couple of points that hopefully can get you excited about this as well. So September 1st, Rusty is going to be here, and he's coming to be our discipleship minister. And we'll talk on the next slide a little bit about what that means specifically, because that's not really a common um, job title in the Churches of Christ, at least not one that I've heard a lot about, but that's what he's coming here to do. He is going to continue to live for the time being in Memphis. And he is committed to traveling to and from Prattville and burning up the road um, really as often as he can. Um, and he does that for the purpose of being with us. He's absolutely going to be up here preaching uh, a good bit. He's going to spend time with our staff in mentoring. He's going to spend time with um, the six of us and, and kind of helping us form up uh, and further define and, and, and then communicate. Um, communication is one of his big things. Um, communicate that vision and communicate that to where we can kind of all come together around that central purpose. And you may say, that's kind of weird, working remotely. Um, Rusty does this all the time, and he's extremely gifted at this and has been doing this for years um, on the um, church side, but also um, kind of going back to what Keith was saying, um, he does this on a global scale, literally, not, uh, I mean, like all over the globe, um, conducts business and is very used to being in different places and conducting business from different places. So we're fully confident in his ability to do this. It's a, it's a little bit of an odd um, situation, odd dynamic, but we, we're not really concerned about that at all. We feel like he can be fully effective in doing the things we're asking him to do, um, just may look a little bit different than, than what we're typically used to. So you may say, okay, well, what's the long-term plan? This, this seems like kind of a, a short-term thing. Well, the long-term plan is to have Rusty help us to move further down this path. As Mac was saying, we've, we've identified through his help some areas that we really want to step into and that we really as a church feel like we're being led to, to do more of and to be more intentional with. He's absolutely going to help us implement that strategy. He's going to help us as a church, all of us, to, to more fully step into those things that we mentioned earlier. Um, so so that's, that's kind of what he's here to do. And then the long term, we'll be honest with you, we've, we've spent you know, months at this point in prayer about this as as he, and we don't know what the end, uh, the end game actually looks like. We do know that this is, this is a direction that we want to go, and we find this to be a meaningful step in that direction, and we feel like he's the right person to come alongside of us at the right time to really help us implement this. So, Dennis, let's go to the next uh, slide. So what, what in the world does a discipleship minister do? My goodness, that's some small print. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to, you guys can read, you're all smart, but I'm going to read these just to make sure I, I hit everything that we had intended to say. So he's going to help us develop new leaders through mentorship and training. We are very passionate about each of us being equipped individually, not just, hey, as a church, are we getting service done? But are we using our talents? Are we using our God-given abilities to affect change, to affect 
growth in his kingdom. And he's coming here to help us do that. He's going to, to, to help us develop training programs for different ministry levels at Hunter Hills. He's going to promote a focused, well-communicated mission plan. I love this, well-communicated mission plan. We can have a mission plan all day. We can have the greatest vision ever. But if we don't do anything about it, if we don't actually implement anything, then it doesn't do us any good. He's coming to help us do that. Extremely excited about that. He's going to develop a, a discipleship plan that assesses where we're each at individually and helps us to use our gifts. One, identify what's my gift, what am I good at, what are the things I, I'm actually talented at. If I can't sing, I probably don't need to be on the praise team. If I'm no good at, at getting up in front of people and talking, I probably don't need to be a teacher. But there's plenty of, of things that I can do to serve. As Stephen was mentioning, all the different parts of the body. There's, all, there's a place for all of us, and he's going to help us plug in where we can be most effective. He's going to help with our worship um, environments, not only on Sunday, but you know, other times we're going to try, to try to get more involved there. He's going to help the leadership and development of the ministry staff. We've got great ministers on our staff. He's going to help them become even greater. And then, if you can read the small print, what do you notice is the last thing? He's going to preach at least twice per month. And you may say, okay, yeah, you just had to put that in there. It's, it's in my mind at least, and I think in our minds, it's intentional that that's the last thing on this list. He, he's coming to preach. He absolutely will be up here, and he's extremely gifted at doing that. There's no doubt about that. But we want to make sure you understand he's not coming to be the traditional preacher who's going to get up and preach and then do all of our work essentially for us. We're, we're calling all of, our, all, all of us, us included, to a higher level of service and dedication and engagement at the church. All right, I think that's all we, we wanted to say at the moment. And we've got, actually got a, um, a message here um, from Rusty. So let's play that, Dennis. Good morning, church. I am so excited to be joining the Hunter Hills ministry staff in the role of discipleship minister. I want to thank the elders for the conversations that we've had that have shown me their vision for moving Hunter Hills more deeply into God's plan for his church. And I want to thank them for the trust that they're putting in me to walk with you on this journey. I know that this arrangement looks different from what you're used to, but I've already seen God work through these conversations in a really powerful way. I look forward to telling you those stories over the next few months. I'm convinced that he's going to bless this arrangement. I have so many special relationships at Hunter Hills already, and I'm excited to be able to strengthen those relationships and build new ones there. I'm excited to work with your ministry staff. I'll be there in September. And I'm looking forward to preaching every weekend in September and then working with the rest of the staff on putting plans together to help us more fully engage every member at Hunter Hills to use their God-given talents and gifts to expand the kingdom and to live more fully into the identity that we have as believers and disciples. Hunter Hills, I can't wait to be with you. Look forward to seeing you soon. Blessings. Okay, so as we're all sent out into community, please stand so that we can all stand unified as we say a prayer uh, for Rusty and a prayer of blessing over us, and then you'll be sent. Father God, we love you, and we're so thankful that you love us so much, and we're thankful for Rusty because we know that he loves your people here at this church, and we're just so thankful for your servant, Rusty, and we're so excited about the way that he's going to be serving here among us and teaching us how to better serve each other, Father, and we just pray a, a prayer of blessing over him as he does that. Uh, we pray for, for wisdom. Uh, we pray for just stamina, and we pray for just um, energy, not only from him, but from all of us as we engage in this family together, Father. Uh, Father, for all the ways that you bless us, but mostly for your Son, through whom we pray, we say, Amen.